Our intelligence agencies can do a lot, and they can create significant damage to Mr. Putin and the Russians, uh, but we're not rogue agencies. Uh, you know, you need to get an order from the president, from the commander-in-chief, to do something like so this. So no deep state. <laughs> I wish we have deep states sometimes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ian Bremmer, and welcome to the G Zero World podcast. I'm host of the weekly show G Zero World on Facebook Watch. In this podcast, we share extended versions of the big interviews from that show. This week, I sit down with Ali Soufan, CEO of the Soufan Group, and a former FBI agent who investigated the 9/11 attacks. He's a leading national security and counterterrorism expert who The New Yorker described as coming closer than anyone to preventing 9/11. There's even a Hulu miniseries, The Looming Tower, that's partly based on Ali's time in the FBI. Today I'll ask him about turf wars in the U.S. intelligence community, the future of terrorism, and the major threats facing the United States today. Let's get to it. The G-Zero World is brought to you by our founding sponsor, First Republic. First Republic, a private bank and wealth management company, places clients' needs first by providing responsive, relevant, and customized solutions. Visit firstrepublic.com to learn more. I'm here with Ali Soufan, one of the world's leading experts on counterterrorism, CEO of the Soufan Group author of The Anatomy of Terror, and also the new Hulu show is critical to it, The Looming Tower. Ali, welcome to the G-Zero. Thank you. So you served in the FBI uh, for about a decade. A lot of scrutiny around your former shop, the FBI yeah. these days, uh, feelings of less legitimacy. I, I note that uh, there's a photograph of you with Robert Mueller right behind you. How do you think the FBI's doing right now? I think uh, this is not the first time that the Bureau get criticized. Uh, remember, um, you know, at, at one point in the 90s, we were called, uh, or we, you know, people claimed that we are part of a, a right-wing conspiracy um, uh, against the president and against the administration. I think the Bureau, uh, definitely a lot of people get frustrated with all the constant attacks against the organization. But at this point, most of the people that I talk to inside the organization, they're just like toning it out. They will do their job. They continue to do their job and um, let the chips uh, fall where they may. You think morale is among the people you talk to in the FBI right now feels okay? It's not as high and it's not low. I think uh, they are toning these things down and they are just focusing on the threat that they have. A lot of people in the Bureau and in the intelligence community believe that we are under attack uh, by the Russians. Uh, you've seen uh, a couple of weeks ago the hearing um, in Congress where the heads of all the different intelligence agencies, to include the CIA and the FBI, DNI, NSA, all of them said that the Russians uh, not only interfered in 2016 election, but also at the same time they said that they are getting ready to interfere in the 2018 election. Um, and I think um, we have a job. The Bureau have a job with the, our, you know, brothers and sisters and the CIA and other other... And they've all agreed that this is agree. going on. There is, there is so we agreement. don't have the infighting, at least. See, th this is one of the things is there's a lot of similarities to before 9-11 when uh, a lot of people in the intelligence community and in the FBI, we were saying, hey, we need to pay attention to this guy, Osama bin Laden. And uh, at the time... We didn't have much response from the political leadership. And now we have a similar situation when, where everybody, uh, even more than in the 90s, saying, look, we have to focus on this Russian threat. And unfortunately, we're not, gonna get, we're not getting any response from the political leadership. Uh, you know, our intelligence agencies can do a lot and they can create significant damage to Mr. Putin and the Russians, uh, but we're not rogue agencies. Uh, you know, you need to get uh, an order from the president, from the commander in chief to do something like so this. So no deep state. <laughs> I wish we have deep states sometimes. <laughs> 20 years now of a war on terror. How are we doing? We're not good. I mean, if you look at uh, the eve of 9-11, bin Laden has 400 members. That's an, um, the, the, the full membership of Al-Qaeda, we're 400 people. 
Uh, today, the people who adhere to bin Ladenism, to the ideas of Osama bin Laden, are thousands upon thousands. Some estimates put them 40 to 50 thousands. Um, now we have Qaeda not only in Kandahar and in Kabul, uh, as we had on 9-11, but we, had it, we have it in, in, in Libya, we have it in Tunisia, we have it in a Sahel region, uh, we have it in Yemen, we have it in Syria and Idlib especially. We have it all over the Muslim world and the Arab world. So I think if you look at the map today, the threat is way more significant than it used to be before 9-11, and that's very, very concerning. How much is that threat oriented at the United States? The main enemy um, is the United States, it's meaning the West, the Crusaders and the Jews. And eventually, they're going to go back to that. But now they are taking advantage of an environment that's allowing them to operate in a way um, you know, under the table, um, build their network, recruit more people, um, uh, you know, develop more resources for their jihad. And when, uh, you know, when in specific areas they cannot do that anymore and they feel that they are under siege, uh, they will try to attack the United States again. I have no doubt about that. I mean, how much is the far enemy relevant to them? How much is it about uh, injustices real and perceived in their immediate surroundings now? This is a very good uh, good question. So Al-Qaeda, their, their theory goes with the management of savagery. And the management of savagery theory is um, basically create uh, chaos in different zones around the world. And when you have this chaos and uh, you create instability, uh, you try to uh, take, you know, try to fill that vacuum yourself and not allow others to fill it. I take it that the failure of the Arab Spring in most of the region is one of the contributing factors that you would point to? The nation state concept is something brand new to the Middle East, you know, happened after World War I and after World War II. So if you look into, for example, a place like Iraq, what's Iraq without Saddam? It's a bunch of sects and ethnic groups. It's Shia and Sunnis and Turkmen and Kurds. You know, there is no nation state concept. What does it mean to be an Iraqi? I think for the Shia, it means something very different than it means for the Sunni or it means for the Kurds. Uh, you have the same thing in Libya. Uh, without Gaddafi, oh, what does it mean to be Libyans? Uh, so you have the East, the East versus the West. You have tribal elements. Um, all contribute to the chaos that currently exists uh, exist in Libya. So I think definitely the Arab Spring um, uh, created an opportunity uh, for radical groups to recruit, to grow. So we're seeing a lot of these groups just expanding because of a lot of the local issues. And that's why I believe any strategy needs to have diplomacy at its core. It's not only about military and intelligence. These are really important and we need to have them. But also, most of the factors, at least in the Middle East, we're not talking about Western Europe here, but at least in the Middle East, that's contributing to this is based on that diplomat, it's, it's based on the geopolitical chaos that exists today in the Middle East. Our military, you know, they do a great job in containing, you know, the threat, but towards the end, we established uh, at multiple occasions the conditions to have diplomatic initiatives, and unfortunately, uh, our politicians and our diplomats failed. Um, so we we keep the uh, we keep the whole thing in in the hand of the military. We haven't brought up Islam, mm -hmm. and I wonder how you think about uh, the Islamic religion, uh, political Islam, in the region as it is right now, as a contributing factor. Uh, to the nature of the terrorist challenge that we have today. Interpretation of Islam is definitely a factor of the instability, and that's both on uh, the Shia side and the Sunni side. We cannot just ignore it. Today, unfortunately, sectarianism is being used as a geopolitical tool. So the Crown Prince uh, of Saudi Arabia has uh, talked some very significant reforms across the board, anti-corruption, economic reform, political reform, reform of political Islam as well. How seriously uh, do we take that? Do we think it's actually making a difference uh, in the way uh, Islam works, uh, both there and more broadly? Let's see how it goes. We've, we've heard that before. Uh, we've heard it uh, after 9-11. We've, uh, we, we've heard it 
many times. I mean, there is two different things that you have to think about when it comes to the Saudi alleged reforms. Uh, number one, is that reform, uh, that does it include, for example, limiting uh, Saudi uh, regional powers using sectarianism? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, without, without radical Sunni Wahhabism, what is the link between the tribes in, in Iraq or the tribes in Yemen and the Saudis? There is no link whatsoever. So now I think the reform is happening, and what we've, at least what I've seen, the reform is happening or basically uh, trying to control the voices that can oppose the new regime in Saudi Arabia. So I think we have to take everything that we've seen going on in Saudi Arabia with a grain, uh, with a grain of salt uh, until we see how they're going to move with this. Most of the people who have been really um, strongly advocating uh, violence um, against others based on their sect or based on the religion, uh, they are still uh, free in Saudi Arabia. Those who wanted to reform uh, whatever the meaning of reform is, the Saudi government from inside, those are in jail. So we have to take that very carefully. Back in 9-11, uh, we didn't have Facebook. Uh, we, you know, we, we didn't have the smartphones. We barely had Google. Uh, used by both sides. Uh, the bad guys to communicate, the good guys to try to catch them. Where's the balance there? Who's winning? basically have a lot of positive and negative. The positive, that um, everything is happening in the open, and if you have good intelligence, you can control and see what's going on. The negative is um, you reach so many people around the world, and um, you know, even if a small little percentage of these individuals, 0.001%, uh, believed in that specific message, that's a huge amount of numbers, and that what we've seen, you know, ISIS, for example, utilizing, um, you know, very effective. Is that where our lone wolves are coming from? Most of the lone wolves that we've seen uh, are people who are recruited, especially in the United States, recruited through social media. Not even recruited. Uh, they have been inspired, inspired in social media. Sometimes they don't even have any contact with anybody from ISIS. The situation in Europe is different. There's a lot of issues that has to do with assimilation. It has to do with feeling part of a country. And the, the the foreign fighter phenomena in Europe has been mostly a francophone phenomena. Uh, most of the numbers, the biggest amount of numbers, are in, in, in from France and from Belgium and stuff like that. And these, based on communities that came from North Africa and haven't been really assimilated well in, in the society. So the situation in Europe is a little bit different than the situation um, we have here in the United States. Alex Sifan, keep up the good fight. Thank you. Thanks for being here. That's it for this week. Next week, come back, we're gonna have Peter Maurer. He is the president of the International Committee for the Red Cross. I'll see you next week. The G Zero World is brought to you by our founding sponsor, First Republic. First Republic, a private bank and wealth management company, places clients' needs first by providing responsive, relevant, and customized solutions. Visit firstrepublic.com to learn more. You're listening to the G-Zero World with Ian Bremmer podcast, your weekly geopolitical deep dive into the world's biggest news stories, featuring in-depth conversations with global leaders and newsmakers. To get more of G-Zero's insights on global politics every morning, sign up for our free newsletter, G Zero Daily at gzeromedia.com.